a strange song, but I thought there was one chord that's noteworthy. Whoa, crazy chord. What on earth is that? Well, that's called a, a seven sharp nine. Dominant seven sharp nine. In most circles, that's what it's called. Um, it's a famous chord. Jimi Hendrix used it, for sure. Uh, to start off uh, Foxy Lady, and that's his opening chord for Foxy Lady. It's a dominant seven sharp nine. Um, it's a very dissonant chord. It uh, introduces a lot, introduces a lot of tension into the music, even when you know um, it's not really super expected. It's like an immediate, like spice up the song chord. And how is it constructed? Well, the most popular uh, usage of it is on the guitar is probably an E7 sharp nine, which uh, is traditionally played uh, maybe like a open or an X on the six string and then you get a seven six seven eight X typically so you could play it with the open six string even open first string just because those are both E's but if you mute both of them it could just be this kind of middle four uh, string chord so that you're got your X seven six seven eight experiment with it play it, it sounds amazing and uh, super complex. And what does it pair well with? Well, it's it's usually using the key of A minor, or like a, um, uh, or even just like a E blues. Um, <clears throat> so when it's in the, the key of A, it functions as the five chord, which is uh, also known as the dominant. Hence why you got the whole concept of uh, dominant seven chord. Um, and then in the key of E, it would just function as like a super dissonant chord on the tonic. And uh, the chord is constructed in a very, very interesting way. You have E, G sharp, and then you have a B in most cases, unless you're playing it on guitar or you're some cool jazz musician and you like to omit certain notes. The B is often the one that's omitted just because it doesn't contribute a ton of flavor or distinctive flavor to the chord so when you omit it you don't really miss it too much so you got your E your G sharp and then kind of the B except it's usually omitted and then you have a D which is your flat 7 that creates that dominant 7 sound but what the heck is this sharp dude in front of me is smoking weed in the car he's hotboxing crazy um, so E G sharp and then B, sometimes omitted. You got your D, which is your flat seven, which creates that four note dominant seven chord. And then you got this really funky note, okay? This is the note that makes the E7 sharp nine sound so crazy. It's the sharp nine note, which if you know the nine from E, and you count an E major scale and you go E, and I don't know where E is in the, the uh, perfect pitch world, but let's see. Let's say this is an E, I'm just guessing. E, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. I need a warm up. Yeah. I need a warm up. Nine. Okay, so a nine is an F sharp. I don't even know if I sang that in tune, but if E is the root of the chord, then the ninth would be F sharp according to the E major scale. In case you're wondering, that's how you name every part of a chord is according to the major scale. What would that note be in relation to the root of the chord if the root of the chord were the tonic of the key, were the one of the key, right, the do. So if E is a do, F sharp is the ninth or the, uh, the re above the do in the next octave, okay? What language is this guy speaking? Whoa. So, um, F sharp is the ninth, but we don't have an F sharp in this chord. You could have an E7 and then you add the ninth, and that would be called an E9 or an E dominant nine, or a lot of different names for certain chords, but E7 sharp nine would be an E with an F double sharp. It would be an E7 with an F double sharp. And then you might be asking, well, Warren, what the heck? Why don't you just call it a G? Astute 
a stu student you would be to ask that question. And F double sharp doesn't exist uh, per se, except in theory. So you would take an F sharp, which is a black key on the piano, and you would go one more half step above, which would G be G, and it would look like G. But people don't really call it a G in theory, because F double sharp helps you maintain the chord naming practice, okay? And what is this whole thing about chord naming? Chord naming is not a science. It is somewhat of an art, and uh, it's about essentially boiling down a couple of things. How much do you want to communicate? How important is it that you communicate very, very extensively and exhaustively what you desire in the chord? Well, E7 sharp 9 makes things easier because it's root 3rd, 5th, flat 7th, ninth, and you sharp the ninth. So you could think, da, 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 skip a note, skip a note, skip a note, skip a note, right? And that's how chords in uh, tertian harmony are formed. They're formed by thirds. So you got your third between the root and a third, third or minor third between the third and the fifth. And then the fifth, even though sometimes it's omitted anyway, the fifth to the flat seventh is a minor third, flat seventh to a ninth is a major third. So a flat seventh to a sharp nine, in this case, would be an augmented third, but at least it's still a third. So if we can think of everything in terms of thirds, then it helps keep our world of chords, our dictionary of chords, a little more tidy. You know what I'm saying? It keeps it nice and neat and organized. But in reality, okay, if you were to tell somebody to play a G, they would be able to play and it would sound just fine with that chord. And it would introduce that same nasty tension that the E, wow, this guy who cut me off is like, unbelievable driver, wow. Man, he's Asian too, man, making us look bad. Anyway, so, uh, E, uh, e, you gotta, you gotta fight the stereotype, bro. Fight the stereotype. Okay, so you got your E, G sharp, B, D, and F double sharp. If someone played a G, it would be the same note as an F double sharp. It would introduce that same nasty sound, which makes that chord so interesting and powerful. Uh, but if you ask somebody to play an F double sharp, unless they were a music theory guy, they'd look at you funny. They'd be like, what on earth? is an F double sharp and you would just have to tell them oh yeah play play a G and then you'd just be like I don't feel like explaining this to them because uh, this is a dumb theory thing but if you think about it it actually is pretty smart to be able to name all chords according to a, a structure of third 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 root to third of the chord third to fifth of the chord fifth to the flat seventh of the chord flat seventh to the sharp ninth of the chord they're all thirds and in that same way, the whole concept of jazz where you're adding upper extensions to make chords more and more complex and include more and more notes uh, from the scale diatonically or even non-scale notes, aka non-diatonic or, or more chromaticism. You can have the 9th, you can have the 11th, you can have the 13th. You can't have a 15th because the 15th is just two octaves higher than the uh, root. But that's basically uh, every note you could possibly include into the chord is in the chord. You have eight different notes in a scale, and um, eight and one are actually the same note because they're an octave. And so when you get root, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, thirteenth, that's seven notes. I'm driving with my knee. Uh, seven notes um, are all the notes of a particular scale. So, you know, there exists chords where you can play like a F13, that's a super popular chord. You would typically play it on the guitar like a 1x, 1, 2, 3x, and obviously that's only a four note chord, but you are uh, you only have six strings, so you have to omit some notes. And so when you play a 1x, 1, 2, 3, um, you've got the flat seventh, which is super important to lending color to the chord, and then you've got the third, which is on your third string, second fret, and that's the third of the F chord. And then you have the 13, which is the third fret, second string. And so you have the 13, you have the flat seven, you have the third. So you know it's a major chord because of the third. You know 
what's a dominant seven chord because that flat seventh on the uh, fourth string, and you know on the second string that there's a thirteen in it. So your ear can kind of imply the uh, the eleven or uh, the sharp eleven. Depends on the context that you're in. Uh, I rarely see the uh, the regular um, eleven included with the thirteen because the sharp eleven kind of uh, works better with with it depending on the context of the song, of course. But anyway, music theory nerd rambling uh, about jazz chords, and I don't really even play jazz, but I find the whole concept of chords being stacked thirds like a super super simple concept that ends up yielding a ton of complexity, right? So it's kind of like the whole idea of like starting simple with like a recipe and then slowly expanding out and getting more and more complex, you know? Like, oh, I baked the cake. Oh, I baked the strawberry cake. Or, oh, I baked the chocolate strawberry cake. Oh, I baked the, uh, a red velvet strawberry cake with chocolate on top. And you just like start to innovate and innovate and man, things get crazy real fast. And um, so the idea of thirds, AKA tertian harmony, um, is something that I uh, lay down uh, the, the bedrock solid foundation in my theory module on harmony. And the first four, four or five videos, four, four videos, five videos, are on theory, 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 theory of harmony, how chords are built how thirds contribute to triads and how triads are just stacked thirds and what they sound like vertically um, in isolation in terms of notes, how they relate to each other and how they sound over time um, as they exist over time and eventually in chord progressions and then there's the vertical and the horizontal aspect of chord progressions as different notes are moving in different directions they're moving up and down relative to each other and left and right over time uh, I explain all of that, so like in my theory stuff, it's like A to Z. A lot of this stuff I'm talking about in the car is like <laughs> the letters G, H, and I of the alphabet. You, you can't start talking about theory at the letter G if you have no A, B, C. So start with A. Go to the harmony module. First few videos, you'll be free. Just check it out, see if you enjoy it. There's worksheets that come with it. And uh, it's gonna just really, really help your mind grasp what's going on in harmony. And not just any harmony, harmony in the songs that you love. Harmony in the songs that you love will suddenly become a little bit more accessible, a little bit more tangible, you know? I don't even know what this is. I guess I'm grasp, grasping it. Grasp the harmony you love probably scaring a lot of people away with this video. But if you're still here, congrats. We talked about the E7 sharp nine chord. Go ahead and play it. X7678 and get some foxy lady going when you include the open six string. Open six string. Rest of the chord. Um, bom, bom, ba, ba, dom, bom, ba, and then bom, bom, ba, and then fifth fret six string. 6th fret, 6th string, 7th fret, 6th string, and then 5th fret, 5th string. I don't even know if I'm in the right key, but boom, boom, ba, ba, da, boom, boom, ba, foxy. So keep it foxy, y'all.